Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. I hope you guys are doing well. As we wait for people to come in the stream, good evening, good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Scratch. Scratch. Uh, Scratch is in the house. All right. Scratch. Isn't that the name of that um, squirrel on uh, that one show? Um, Not Frozen, but... uh, I don't know. I forgot the cartoon, but there was a little squirrel. He's he's he was super cute, and I thought his name was Scratch. Was that from? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The little Ice Age. Ice Age. Yeah, yeah. Is that from Ice Age? I think so. You know, and I don't really watch those uh, shows, but I, I'm thinking that's what it is. It feels right. And hello, Crystal Core, Annie Lou Who, and Richard. Hi, guys. Good to see you guys, Jessica, Richard. It's good to have you guys doing amazing out there. It was an, a nice day. It was warm, hot again, you know, in the 90s. Did some mantras outside in the sun. It was beautiful. Lilo and Scratch. No. Chris, of course. <laughs> That's Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Lilo and Stitch. There you go. Benjamin and Ogilvy. Hello. Mercy Anonymous in the house. Hello, hello, hello. It's great. The room is just filling up. Awesome. Oh, so you've had that nickname since you were 14. I I will not ever let you guys know what my nickname was. Oh, now you got to tell. Oh, I can't. Okay. We'll I mean, it's it it's just so crazy. We'll t- we'll talk later. <laughs> It was nothing bad, nothing bad. Norman Denver and Slot Junkie, good evening. Sanford P, good to see you. Jeff Blackhurst, good to see you as well. We do create our own stories, we do. Well, you know, it, it was... I think in fifth or sixth grade, and the song Boogie Nights came out. Do you remember that song, Boogie Nights? Mm -hmm. I never liked it or whatever. But anyway, my best friend just started, because of the song, calling me Noogie Nights. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, so he would just go around singing, Noogie Nights. You know. Oh, that's so cute. That's cute. Yeah, it was a goof. You know, it's just one of those things that you get hit with, like Scratch. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it happens. Happens to the best of us. I don't know. Somehow I I ended up with Sassy Susie, but they were calling me that since I was like five years old, and my name is Cindy. And I don't know. It's just, and it stuck. I know. I know. Sassy Susie, and your name is Cindy, and it's not even your middle name or anything. No, so not even the middle name. No, actually, the middle name is William. Oh my God! <laughs> she she let it out. She let the big one out. I was named after my dad. I guess they wanted a boy. It's all good. Yeah, you know, it is. It is all good. So I wanted to talk about one of my favorite subjects. You know, it's amazing the stories that we hear out of the East. And then a lot of them are verified with photos and uh, eyewitness accounts of what can be accomplished through meditation. And uh, if any tradition you know has a history of meditation it's the buddhist tradition for sure and it's really really good for the brain you know i've been working on it now for a couple of years it takes some practice and a little bit of discipline but it's coming along well you know it just gets easier it just gets easier and easier and easier the more you you do it till the point where i mean i could see you know how, and I, I, I've shared with you guys. Um, I have a s- strong series of memories from what I believe is a past life, and I've been told by more than one person of this past life, you know, that verifying what I had seen. So I feel like I lived in a cave uh, on the Tibet-Nepal border, uh, studying under a Buddhist master, and along with other monks so you know i feel like that was one of my last lives if not my last life was as a buddhist monk living in a cave you know over around the tibetan nepal border 
I could see the planes below me, you know, I could see it clearly. I could see uh, the master and my best friend like standing just in front of me there with the uh, saffron robes looking out, you know, over the plane. And uh, it feels so comfortable to me. And as a kid, I was always drawn to, you know, everything Chinese, really. At first Chinese and then in, into uh, Indian history and, and, and the Vedic history eventually um but you know martial arts too i started at 12 and just always felt drawn to that and, and also meditating and you know my son when he was eight years old he would go sit out under the tree for an hour meditating he took after me uh so so much it's just always been a part of my life yeah that i mean i've been drawn to it i wanted to understand it um and because I, I've had a lot of brain turmoil, <laughs> a lot of issues upstairs, and needing to quiet the monkey uh, became really important. So, yeah. Uh, Scratch is going to be calling me Noogie now all the time. Isn't that cute? Going back to grade school, it started to leave me in like 7th and 8th grade. It took, took a few years. It's cute. I just love it. It's great. So... Connie's back again. Dale is as well. Paul E. Now, Paul E. says the rainbow body is our fascia. So I've, I've never heard of that, uh, the fascia being equated to it. Thank you so much, Mark, for your support. We totally appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Now it's so easy to shift brain patterns and, and get into a good state with meditation. Um, it's blissful, really. It is quite blissful. It's like you just kind of lose track of the world. And all you do is you feel your vibrations. For me personally, I feel the energy bodies and it feels wonderful. It does feel really good. Every now and then I'll pop into that blissful state, which is really fun. And there's there's no better drug out there when you can achieve that state of mind on your own. Um, that's incredible. Most definitely. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. So, you know, there's some different kinds of rainbow bodies that are attained. Here you see a photo, the rainbow body, the ultimate fruition of practices is a body of pure light called the rainbow body. So this photo was taken in 2011 for the rainbow body of Chokyur Lingpa Rinpoche. And you can see it, uh, the rainbow just encircling them. Now, you know, it's, it's fascinating because I was actually talking to Cindy's mom today about this and it got me thinking yeah it's it, it's probably been almost two years since i talked about the rainbow body and um it's just you know there's different things that happen with each individual sometimes all that's left is the fingernails and the hair some fingernails and some hair and the monk is completely gone just gone you know and he was there one minute and poofed He's gone. There's a pile of clothes, fingernails, and hair. That That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that goes to say there's something about the light body. I guess we take in more light and less dense, and um, then, then things like this can happen. It doesn't always happen just one way. Um, looking at here out of ancient code, Scientific evidence proves Buddhist monks can transform their bo physical bodies into pure light. When you think about our bodies, you know, mostly we're vacuum. Mostly everything is kind of vacuum when you get down to it. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of reasoning on why, because in some cases they shrink. They, they actually just shrink uh, hour by hour, day by day. And they're still alive you know, when checked, but they're actually shrinking. I mean, this is like wild, crazy stuff, but it just shows the power of consciousness and that we have control over our bodies if we are trained to a very highly degree and very, very dedicated. You know, that's dedication is like the key thing, you know, and, and I'm, 
I would consider myself because I keep up with Michael. I would consider myself dedicated, but still, I'm still only a couple years into it, and he's like a whole bunch of years into it. So, um, you know, changes still need to occur. There can still be more um, changes that are going to be beneficial to my brain for sure. So, did you know that in Tibetan India alone, there are over a hundred and sixty thousand? documented cases of people who after many years of spiritual preparation managed to transform their physical body into a body of pure light energy. In order to attain a rainbow body, a person has to be able to liberate their body into light by having only loving thoughts, among other things, of course. It's believed that every five years on average, an advanced Buddhist monk enters into this enlightened state. The process is extremely powerful and is said that weeks before being able to achieve the transformation, some Buddhist monks can also engrave their hand or foot onto a wall. According to reports, it takes around seven days for the body to eventually shrink, dissolve into light, and transcend. And, you know, this is a photo of a monk right here, and you can see the energy all around him, the energy bodies. It's pretty cool. Over 160,000 documented cases in Sufism, or Taswuf, which is often defined as Islamic mysticism. So we see that there's mystic type of branches in all the traditions. You know, there's Christian mysticism, there's Jewish mysticism, there is also Islamic mysticism as well. And of course, we could kind of view... Uh, you know, Tantra and Hinduism, you know, and some of the other Eastern philosophies is all being very, very mystical as well. So it's pretty cool. So in, in Islamic mysticism, the inward dimension of Islam or the phenomenon of mysticism within Islam, it's called the most sacred body and the supra celestial body. Taoists refer to it as the diamond body. And those who have attained it are named the immortals and the cloud of walkers or the cloud walkers. That's pretty cool. Yogic studios and I'm sorry, yogic schools and tantric teachings call it the divine body. In Kriya Yoga, it's referred to as the body of bliss. In Vedanta, the superconductive body, while the ancient Egyptians called it the luminous body of or being, Ak or the Karast. In Mithraic lit liturgy, it's dubbed as the perfect body. In the Hermetic corpus, it's referred to as the immortal body, while in the alchemical tradition, the emerald tablets call it the golden body. As here, you see a handprint imprinted into a stone. Pretty cool. That is way cool. So they can control their body temperature and, and the force of their body, and it just sort of melted. Yeah, at a certain level, you get the uh, cities, which are superpowers mm -hmm. through meditation, through these type of practices. And uh, right here we see this was Pad Padmasamambhava's handprint. And this is by a Sura cave in, in Nepal. Pretty cool. I mean, that's wild stuff. And I was just checking to make sure he didn't have six fingers. <laughs> I know, right? So this amazing phenomenon is not exclusive to ancient times. There are even recent testimonials about Tibetan monk, uh, monks who have reached this state after a deep process of purification. For example, ordained Catholic priest Francis Tizo documented the case of Kempo Acho, El, El, uh, I'm sorry, a Galupa monk of Kham, Tibet, who died in 1998 and how he managed to transform his body into a body of light. So David Steidel Rost, a Benedictine monk, proposed in 2002 a scientific investigation with the Institute of Noetic Sciences to study the body of light, or rainbow body, saying that if we can establish as an anthropological fact that what is described in the, in the resurrection of Jesus has not only happened to others, but still happening today, it would put our view of human potential in a completely different light. And that's what I've been trying to get across with the channel for so long, you know, because there have been others that have done everything that Jesus is said to do. And Jesus even said, you will do greater things than I. 
and yet somehow people don't believe it's possible and thus they limit themselves they limit their world they live in they limit their potentiality and that's sad because we have to recognize you know that we've been limited on purpose and you know what we can do is really actually amazing by standard modern thought Mm -hmm. yeah and they definitely don't want us to find out and learn these things and they've set our society up and you know even everything even like the food that we eat can block our abilities um and it's just that way across the board and that's why we we end up performing um well eating a vegetarian you know diet for the most part because um that's part of all these eastern traditions is is that if you want to achieve these type of things you're going to have to abstain from meat and then eventually you know, like in the case of the monasteries, you know, again, a lot of them only eat maybe once or twice a day. And it's very, very modest food. So Father Tizo was said to have witnessed a rainbow appearing over Ken, Kenpo Acho's house a few days before his death in September 1998. And that dozens of rainbows appeared afterwards. His body started changing soon after his last breath. His skin turned shiny white and his appearance began to change. He uh, eventually was wrapped in a yellow robe, which all the Galug uh, monks wear. As days passed, the body of Kenpo Acho started shrinking. After seven days had passed, no body remained. It was gone. The event was well recorded by local press, who gave specific accounts of what had occurred, and the rainbow body appeared in an Institute of Noetic Sciences Review, number 59, March, May, 2002. Curiously, the rainbow body of Ken Po Ancho was also mentioned in Matthew T. Capstein in the presence of light, divine radiance, and religious experience. Then we have Tolku Pima Ritzkal, a Nepalese monk, recounting Ancho's transfiguration. Recently, on August 29, 1998, at Dome Kamgak in Azirong in, in Tibet, Ken Po Ancho, 80 years of age, attained physical dissolution. One day at noon, lying in bed without having suffered any recent illness. Because a lot of times they just choose this time. They just feel it's it's a certain time. And they kind of ascend and they leave and then their body goes with them shortly thereafter. So while in a posture of a sleeping lion and reciting a six-syllable mantra, he attained Buddha in the primordial basic matrix of alpha purity, his heart of clear light, reality perfected beyond the intellect as his body dissolved into light his wrinkles vanishing he seemed like an eight-year-old child with a beautiful complexion after a week had passed when people came to know of his death they performed his death puja secretly in order to deceive the authorities and at the time rainbows appeared inside and outside and a pleasant aroma pervaded the place his body gradually diminished in size and at the end he attained buddha Not even his nails and hair were left behind. It was just like a bird flying from a rock. People nearby have no idea where he may have gone. And here you see his tiny body wrapped up and inside a little cooler. Isn't that crazy? It is. It's it's a little strange. What what? Why would they want to deceive the authorities, though? I guess not to draw attention. Oh, okay. (coughs) That's interesting. So you know, I mean. I don't know that 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 was the one thing that struck me weird out of that whole story. It's like, why, you know, what about the authorities? Why would they even be curious? But I, I guess when paranormal things are going on, and you would want to k- sort of kind of keep those things a little hush hush, so no one took him. We don't wouldn't want any scientists to take him or anything. So his, he was about five foot nine inches tall, but two weeks after he passed away. It shrunk, <coughs> excuse me, to about 20 centimeters, approximately 8 inches. Which means his body, including his skeleton, shrank nearly 80%. That's incredible. So this kind of miraculous display shows he has attained the small rainbow body. Which is a sign that he has attained supreme accomplishment of the Buddha. That is, you know, just so, so wild. 
It is, you know, and there's enough of these stories to go around that, I mean, not, I mean, look at, look at this one. This is another interesting one. You know, it has, it has to do with probably what you eat, your purity of your heart and all of these things. And these things are kept from us. And, and I don't think that's very nice. I think we should be being taught this stuff from, from kindergarten, actually from birth. Well, that would change our perception of everything. So there are three levels of the rainbow body. There is A, a rainbow body, B, a rainbow body of light, and C, the rainbow body of great transference. A is the most common level. It's a normal rainbow body that occurs only after body death. Every five years or so, a Buddhist from Tibet enters into this state. So it's a regular occurrence. There are no physical signs indicating the start of the process before death. And once physical death occurs, it takes on average seven days for the body to shrink and dissolve into light. And most of the time, a small child-sized body remains behind. And in more advanced yogis, only hair and nails. The process of dissolving into light is actually visible around the Buddhist in this process, as can be seen in the image from the Lama Achuk Rinpoche that we see here. So you can see how big this monk is compared to this one who is just kind of shrinking away. It's it's kind of like uh, an inversion of birth, going back to almost nothingness, going in reverse. It's really pretty wild here. And here's a photo. So Chogyur Lingpa over here, rainbow body and his handprints. Only a small body of about five centimeters remained. That's over here, five centimeters. So the more advanced level is also called the rainbow body, but for due purposes, let's call it the rainbow body of light. As in this level, all signs are showing up while the yogi is still alive. The process of dissolving into light might go really fast, but in most cases it takes months, a month, two years to complete, all while remaining fully functional. It is also possible that the yogi who is in the middle of this process slows it down or is unable to continue the process and dies before the completion of the rainbow body. This has been the case with most of the famous uh, sitters. If the process is continued, the body will start to shrink and shine re real light over time until it reaches the size of a baby, and then as a flash of bright rainbow light will disappear into emptiness forever. Wow. Mm -hmm. So this monk was well on the process but did not complete it. Now the most advanced and extremely rare is the attainment of the rainbow body of great transference. In this level, the yogi not only dissolves the body completely into light, but remains functional and visible as light. That's really, really cool. That's some interesting stuff. You know, I mean, as far as being able to do this and all this information is, you know, I'm sure a lot of processes and stuff are kept from us, which is sad. You know, it should be more open to, to learn how to attain this from a young age. Well, ultimately, we are light. You know, that's that's the bottom line is we're energy, we're consciousness. We create the body in order to inhabit it. You know, so as I've shared with you guys, uh, as a child for, you know, over 20 years, I was kind of haunted by this, my aunt's house, you know, and I would kind of see or feel, I would just feel a being like flying around the house like a ghost. And in meditation, it came to me that it was actually me out of the body. And once I had that realization, I never had bad nightmares and I wasn't afraid anymore. You know, it, it, that whole situation of it kind of haunting me for so long uh, just stopped because I recognized that it was me out of the body. Because we have a body, but we're not the body. Yeah, and those are some realizations that, that would be nice to, um, to be taught when you're young learn these things when you're young so you can get a good grasp of it when you're older yeah it's it's amazing what can be achieved absolutely amazing what can be achieved 
and I got a couple more uh, links for you guys. So, you know, for clarification, the author here is saying it's not spontaneous human combustion. That's something totally, totally different. And uh, we see some different cases here. Dr. Duncan Ohm McDowell McDougall, uh, who was born in 1866 and died in October 1920, was an early 20th century physician in Haverhill, Massachusetts, who sought to measure the mass lost by a human when the soul departs the body at death. I've heard about this one before. Uh, he attempted to measure the mass of six patients at the moment of death. His first subject, the results from which uh, he got and felt that they were the most accurate, lost three-fourths of an ounce, which has since been popularized as 21 grams. The rainbow body goes way beyond this value. So is the body really dead? Peter Noble from the University of Washington has done some very interesting research in 2016 in the field of post-mortem life where he found that Certain genes, specifically 500 of them, are even more active and alive after bodily death than before, peaking four days after body death. So it seems that the brain and the body are still alive, even though we consider it the end. Another very interesting finding was that certain embryonic genes that developed the brain and the eyes were once again activated after the body death. It was found that the last cells to die are stem cells. They take up to 17 days after the body's death to die. This is all very interesting research when you continue reading about the phenomena called the rainbow body. So the ultimate great accomplishment in meditation is the attainment of the rainbow body. It's widely recognized as a sign of extreme sanctity in Tibetan Buddhism and among the Banpo. Reports of this level of transmutation are rare, but they occur and have been chronicled far into antiquity. The rainbow body, however, is not limited to Buddhism only, as you'll see in pictures below. But to understand the process, we will turn to the well-documented and delineated practices of Dostian in Tibet and reflect on this practice and the stories of Valar from South India who went through the same process. So, yeah, there's been many cases of this. And, you know, as, as I said, 160,000 document, documented cases. Pretty interesting stuff. So, basically, to reach the highest state possible in meditation, the so-called Jalas Pawa Chenpo, or Rainbow Body of Great Transference, all three... Granthis, otherwise known as the Three Dantians, which we talked about a ton of times uh, from Qigong, or used as the Three Banhas in yoga, have to be cleared of stress completely. How do you know when this is done completely? Number one, Brahma Granthi, completely stress-free. Sexual energy and the universe are one and the same. No more blockages found with Tantra. Number two, Vishnu Granthi, completely stress-free. No more breathing needed as an immediate effect. Also, no food consumption needed anymore. And then number three, Rudra Granthi, Ganthri, completely stress-free. No more thoughts or dreams. Absolute ego death. So, eh, pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, pretty hard to attain too. It makes me curious, like the energy work that we do. And the tuning forks that I use when you're talking about all this energy body, I wonder if like if we could see them after they die and actually tune them and physically see the energy moving around. I guess I'm, I'm sure the vibrations way. would still reach them, you know, yeah. on, in some ways. So often masters that attain the rainbow body will return one last time out of compassion to their beloved disciples and give what are known as posthumous teachings, delivered in the form of a last testament. Often the master is in the transfigured state on the occasion, and perhaps suspended in the sky. So, as you see Jesus there. And this is another, this is Lama Achuk Rinpoche. So he achieved the rain, rainbow body at the age of 84. It was a great inspiration to disciples to persevere in their practice of the great perfection teachings. 
So 29th of August, 2011, the cremation ceremony of him commenced. The body of Lama Achuk shrunk from a height of 1.8 meters to about 3 centimeters tall. Pretty wild stuff. And here we see another one in his rainbow body. And yet others. Twenty centimeters in size, fifty centimeters long there, and then going back throughout history, also so. Pretty wild stuff. It is. And, um, you know, I'm always wishing, always, always wishing that these are things that could be taught in school. So for anyone who's homeschooling, this might be something interesting, you know, as a science project or something to look into for the kids um, and expose them to something different. It'd be beautiful, I think. Yeah, it's good to learn different teachings. You know, and so this is from Shambhala Publications. There's some really good books that they have put out over the years. Christian Buddhist Explorations into the Rainbow Body. So, you know, if the world could get to the point where it's no longer so dogmatic, dogmatic and was just looking at things from, you know, wanting to understand what each tradition has gleaned. You know, what, what pearls of wisdom has each tradition received and can share with others instead of, you know, the constant, um, you know, of some to, you know, convert, convert, convert. There's only one way, you know, which just creates nothing but dissension and uh, division. So it's it's pretty fascinating. And, you know, so one of the things they mentioned, right, with the three Dantians uh, was basically not needing to eat anymore. You know, that is something that does happen. And um, honestly, you know, when I was probably my, at my most vigilant with my practice and I was living in Florida and I was just eating raw food, honestly, typically it would be um, some fresh fruit and a salad and that was it. Um, and I felt amazing. And I would fast on regular, you know, regular um, intervals. And I had tons of energy. And it really did feel like I was living off a of light a lot more. And I felt wonderful with it as well. We don't eat a lot. You know, um, we typically eat one decent sized meal and maybe a little snack later on, like some cashews or something. Um, but I don't know about you guys lately. I mean, I, I have not felt like uh, I need that much food lately. And I, I th I'm wondering if you guys are going through that as well. And, and it's part, part of the ascension process. And ascension can be pretty uncomfortable, actually, at times. It can be confusing. It can be um, emotional. There's a lot of things going on with ascension that we don't understand. Um, you know, like uh, ancestral DNA could be awakening. So you might have to help your ancestors through some stuff, too. I mean, we're coming to some strange pinnacle of something. Well, this is the apocalypse, you know, so it's the great unveiling as we, we start to understand how things really, really work and how the universe works and, and what our potential is, which our potential is way higher than what we are, what we believe it is, you know, basically in the Western tradition. So, you know, this is something that, as we were saying, it's not really even limited to Buddhist as well. And it's fascinating uh, to look at the cases of these different people that are, you could call them saints, you know, you could call them just simply amazing. Uh, there's so many of them some, from so many different traditions um, that have done amazing things like, like living without food for long periods of time, you know, some supposedly for for decades if not you know some like for almost complete lifetimes 
There was that one Indian yogi that we've seen monitored twice by doctors. Um, I believe the first time was maybe like around 17 days. The second time was like three weeks. He didn't eat or drink anything the whole time. He didn't poop or pee. He did nothing as far as that that went. And he was perfectly fine. All his body processes were fine. And then there's cases of people like St. Francis of Assisi, um, who was seen bilocating. He, he was seen in more than one place at one time and also seen levitating. So that's a Christian monk. Um, there are so many cases on down through the, through the, the centuries of these people that are very, very, quote unquote, holy, uh, very, very devoted of all religions, really. And they have been seen doing miraculous things as well as miraculous healings as well. As you see another case over here of somebody that attained the um, rainbow body. So, you know, it's it's a very ancient tradition. And as we said, there's been 160,000 documented cases. There's different types. Again, we, everything is really mostly just a vacuum. So it, it kind of makes sense when you look at it from that, that standpoint. Yeah, it does. It does. It's all very, very interesting and very, very curious how they do this. And But, you know, they have... Um, access to certain literature that we'll probably never have access to so they can do this and I'm sure that these folks they probably start from birth um, but that doesn't mean we can't be our best self it, it, you know we can still do our best and achieve you know some kind of wonderfulness you know I, I've had kind of a difficult past and I haven't been the healthiest person but just in these last couple of years since I've been meditating and doing the energy um, I'm, I'm getting better I'm, I'm getting better it's just going to be a long slow road because in the beginning things were a little bit rough but you know what you guys if I can do it you can do it so th this is Sri Ananda Maima and you know she is another one that is you could just look at her face and can't you see that she's like pure love um you know she is was a, just a beautiful soul and parahamsa yogananda in autobiography of a yogi talks about her and she was always in a state of divine joy and just being around her made you feel so amazingly good so she was born in 1896 and uh, she died in 1982, age 86. But she is another one that went very, very, very long periods of time without eating. And, you know, was able to do a lot of miracles and was just a divine presence. Um, you know, so her name literally means joy permeated in English. And her name was given to her by her devotees in 1920s to describe her perpetual state of divine joy. And uh, just a beautiful individual, another one of those kind of living saints. And, and there are many of them um, that have been there. So one of her sayings here, as you love your own body, so regard everyone as equal to your own body. When the supreme experience supervenes everyone's service is revealed as one's own service call it a bird an insect an animal or a man call it by any name you please one serves one's own self in every one of them and again you know the the concept in hinduism is transmigration of a soul and you recognize that god is in everything god's in that ant walking on the floor god's in the spider that's you know up there in the web waiting to see if the ant's going to come up to him. Uh, the bird chirping out in the tree, everything, everywhere. So, you know, that's, that's how we are to achieve a rainbow body is when you, when you see that and you have that recognition and you hold on to that love and that purity and that peace and compassion is what's emanating from you. It'll physically change the makeup of your body. And, you know, to go to 
kind of solidify that if you look up the work to, work of Dr. Emoto and the story of water. He talks about how your vibration can change how how the water inside of your body works because he did a lot of experiments with that which was really really cool so guys i know this one's a quick one i just wanted to share this with you guys tonight and get us together it's always wonderful to get the family together so i want to thank you guys for your support as always on ko-fi and on patreon um i think one of the other things that um, we kind of came to the decision today was after some meditation, um, the plan's going to kind of be shifting the first channel to more of the, you know, prepping homesteading, because we're going to be doing a lot of homesteading videos, a lot of off grid videos, uh, a lot of, you know, living off the land yourself, how to do that. So, you know, homesteading, off grid, prepping, survival, that type of stuff. More on the first channel, keep the second channel more spiritual uh, as we've been doing for the most part and looking into the hidden, hidden history on this channel as well. So I want to thank you guys as always for your support and being part of this family. Thanks, you guys. You guys are always terrific. God bless and namaste. God bless, guys. Namaste.